Welcome to the Mind Vine Podcast, where we challenge the stigma associated with mental illness through conversations about a variety of issues impacting mental health. Here we bring you news, views, and interviews that intrigue, educate, and celebrate recovery. Leading us on this journey are the hosts of the Mind Vine Podcast, Daryl Mathers and Chris Bovey. Welcome to the Mind Vine Podcast. Uh, my name is Daryl Mathers. I'm with my co-host uh, Chris Bovey and. Uh, we are a special edition uh, this time around. We're at 777 Bay Street Triple here seven. in Toronto. Just, 777 Bay Street in Toronto <laughs> on Bell Let's Talk Day. And yep. we've had a few guests already. We have a couple more uh, ahead. And uh, we're with uh, a special guest at the moment, Kevin Bailey, former Oshawa General, where uh, I currently live. Yep. Uh, Queens uh, <laughs> grad, I guess uh, you yep. can say, I right? You're officially, uh, grad, officially yeah. a grad. Yeah. And uh, also getting into mental health and the law. Lots of, you know, I was going to joke that you made the transition all hockey players do, right? And from hockey to law, right? Like a lot of hockey players do that. But <laughs> yeah. um, anyways, welcome and thanks for being a part of our podcast. Yeah, no, thanks for having me on, guys. I, I think this is an amazing cause and I'm honored to be here. Great. So we're going we're gonna to talk a lot of things. Uh, we've got to start with hockey. You, you're one of the few guys who played five seasons in the O, right, in the Ontario Hockey League. And then uh, you played five seasons in the, I guess it's called... Uh, you sport now yep. uh, might, have, might have been CIS when you started your career and then yep. uh, formerly CIU for old guys like me and Chris <laughs> and uh, you've been 10 years at a really high level of hockey and um, I wonder because you just mentioned that it's your first year not uh, playing but what has that period in, of your life uh, meant to you the last 10 years of playing in the O and in a university experience? Yeah, it, it was it was a wild wild experience. It was you know at that part of your life from the age of let's say fourteen, fifteen, sixteen to the age of twenty six. I think people go through a lot of personal development um, without having to move away from home, without having to do other things like that. Have uh, put yourself in high pressure situations. So you're kind of figuring yourself out while you're also trying to you know seek out a career that has a, a fairly short time timeline. Um, and so while you're going through it. Um, you know, I have all the time in the world for, for athletes that are, are struggling with identity and, and mental health issues uh, because you're kind of juggling multiple balls all at once. Um, but looking back on it, coming through the other side, I think that, you know, it's really shaped who I've become today. And, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the person that I am today. And I think going through that uh, dual transition period all at once kind of helped me uh, shape who, who I become uh, at this present day. A lot of people, when they think of OHL players, they think of, you know, graduating from there and playing, whether it's obviously in the NHL, but even minor pro. But in reality, the majority of them end up playing Canadian university hockey, yep. uh, or a lot of them do as well, or um, do a lot of them end up playing university hockey is what I'm trying to say. Um, what is the what is the difference between the two? I would think in the OHL you have a maybe a dedicated uh, focus, whereas maybe in university hockey it's you're being pulled in a lot of different directions. Like, what would be the difference between the the two? Yeah, it's 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 interesting because when you're in OHL, you're there doing a job. You're there. You, nobody goes to the OHL without the intention of trying to make it to the, the professional level. Um, that's kind of why you accept that challenge of going there. Um, if you didn't, you would, you would likely go to the NCAA or, or stick to another route. Um, what I thought was fascinating is when you transition into the, the U, uh, CIS or U Sports or what you want to call it, um, your schedule doesn't change that much. You still practice every day. You still play multiple games a week. But now you have this course curriculum on top of it. Um, I remember in the OHL always complaining that I was so busy, I had no free time or anything. And then when I went to the U Sport, all of a sudden, I have the exact same hockey schedule, but I have six classes to juggle on top of it. So uh, time management becomes uh, a lot more of a priority in the in the U Sport versus the OHL. But I think you have a little bit more perspective when you're for the typical U Sport player. You're more mature. You're older. You you, you can handle pressures differently. You've been in pressure cookers before. Um, and yeah, like as you mentioned, I, I think the teams that I, I was on had a little bit of skewed stats. I think the average is two players per OHL team will have an NHL career. I think the teams I was on was fortunate to have a lot of guys that ended up making it on. But yeah, the, the overwhelming majority of players are, are going to transition into something other than hockey almost immediately after, after their experience in the, the CHL. So when you're in the OHL, I mean, in your mindset, you're thinking... This, is, this could be a career path. I want to play professional hockey. A, a, a lot of guys, that's their sole focus. Now, for you to be able to transition, did you always have a backup plan, or, or were you well-grounded that 
look at, um, here's a path I think I'll go if this doesn't work out. Had you had that contingency plan all along? Or? Uh, no, not really. Um, my plan when I was in there, I was, I was singularly focused on, on making uh, the NHL. Uh, I was fortunate enough to, the way I was brought up, I, I put a, val a certain value on education and I, I never neglected that, but by no means did I think that that was a, a viable plan for me. I, I was all in. Um, and it wasn't until the age of about 21 that I was actually convinced to go to school rather than to continue with a pro career. Um, looking back on it, it was the best decision I ever made. Uh, I don't think I was cut out to be an, an NHL hockey player and you know, I'm, I'm, I'm very satisfied with my life right now. So it worked out well, but no, I think my, I was all in on playing pro hockey, and I think that I would, I would say that that's t the typical mindset of CHL hockey players. Uh, you played with a number of NH current NHL players like Calvin DeHaan, Scott Lawton, Boone Jenner. When you were with uh, London, I think you played with Max Domi. Uh, but you also played with John Tavares, who's uh, a big uh, name here in this city. I think are actually playing tonight. And yeah, I always found him to be, as a fan, just watching him, at, like uh, watching him with the Generals, actually, and then growing up and to roll with the Islanders in here, he just seems like almost like a freak, to be perfectly honest, because he just seems so singularly focused and uh, like mature beyond his years like as a fan. But when you're in the room with him, um, what like is there a John Tavares story or something that you took from his, your experience playing with him that uh, stands out? Um, my, my first thing that comes to mind about John would just kind of be how normal he is when you're around him as a person. He, he really is just, you know, he's just like us. Uh, he just happens to be one of the best hockey players of all time. Um, you know, he doesn't come, he, come, he comes by that humbly. He works very hard and he's, he's been since, who knows, 12 or 13 in the public eye and focused on this goal. Um, for me, what stands out is, you know, going there as a 16-year-old, he was in his NHL draft year. Obviously, it's very intimidating being around someone that good. He just lit me up at practice for the, for the entire day. Um, and he knew that I was kind of, you know, adjusting. And he had, he had gone through that period a few years earlier. And he, he took me out for dinner um, and just kind of walked me through, you know, what life's like here. And, and he was very, put me at ease. He made me feel very comfortable there. And he was just, I will always remember him, aside from being a phenomenal hockey player. And now I get to go, and, you know, he's in Toronto. I get to go cheer for him. But um, I'll just remember him as a, a really good person. He made me feel very comfortable. I, I don't know if I would have been as comfortable in Oshawa at, a, at such a young age without, you know, the man in the room taking the reins and, and really uh, embracing me. And in, because he spent so much time in that city, you hear stories about things that he would do away from the cameras in the community, working with uh, children with special needs and different things that, that uh, seemed to follow him around but n didn't necessarily have a limelight shined on him. Yeah, no, he, I remember uh, in high school, obviously, he, he was always uh, helping out with people, and he was already a celebrity then. He always had time for everybody. Um, you know, he never left anyone feeling slighted. And, you know, for me, as a young hockey player who was aspiring to be, get to the level that he was going to, you know, he kind of showed, like, this is, how you, this is how you act. This is how you operate. And I think that's probably, to this day, left an impression on me where I could never be too big to be a good person or to, to lend a helping hand to people. And that's also part of the reason why I do things like this. And it's, you know, I have a, a platform and a certain skill set. And if I can do that to make people's lives, if I can use that to make people's lives better, why not? I'm just curious about life in the, in the OHL. And so, you know, a lot of young guys are move away from home or live with billets and, and you're at a young age and you're away from your supports and things. And I'm just wondering what you saw sort of in the, in the, in the OHL about young people dealing maybe with anxiety and things. That, and there's a lot of stress to, to perform and they may not have the supports around. And what, did you see things playing hockey about young people sort of struggling on who to talk to or what they were going through? Did they internalize it more? Did they share with their teammates? Yeah, so when I was in the OHL, I think there was a lot more internalization mm -hmm. than I, I at least think and hope happens now. I think w I was getting into it just at the cusp of, you know, when mental health awareness was becoming um, more of a, a pop culture thing to talk about. So when I was there, it was definitely a lot more of an internalization. Um, but in saying that, every billet that I met was phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, I think that at least the organizations I was with has a, a pretty strong vetting process. Uh, they want people that are, have had experience, you know, taking people into their family and helping them deal through th like things that kids go through. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I had three three families over the course of my five years who were all phenomenal to this day. Uh, I'm, I'm, in co I'm in contact with them and I, I think of them as family. Um, for me, I, I had a, 
I don't think, you know, my struggles mentally, I don't think were anything out of the ordinary for people going through that, that kind of a pressure, high pressure environment. But uh, I was actually put in contact, uh, there was a goalie coach, Mike Lawrence, um, with the Oshawa Generals, and he knew that I was, I was just for my, um, based on my performance, he knew that I was dealing with some stuff. And he put me in contact with this uh, man named Benoit Veu uh, out of Cornwall. And he's kind of like a quasi, like I think of him as Yoda. He's kind of like <laughs> a, you know, half psychiatrist, half performance coach kind of person. Right. And uh, they, he hooked me up with him and he said, just talk to him. Like, we're not, we're not here to talk about technique. We're not here to talk about anything. He goes, just talk to me. And, you know, Benoit's an expert at eventually within 15 minutes breaking down those walls and those barriers. And that turned around my hockey career. I think you can, you'll literally, if you looked at my hockey stats, you'll see maybe a 40 point jump in my save percentage. And that was right after I met him. Um, I still, to this day, keep in contact with him I, at the, the firm I work at now. I've, I've told them that'd be a good resource for the firm to have is some performance coaches and things like that. Just for, you know, anyone working so hard at something, any little thing goes wrong. You're, even if you don't necessarily outwardly react to it, it compounds, it can add up. And I think that that's something that helped me. So I, 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 you know, share that advice with people as well. You just touched on uh, the firm you're at now. Uh, take us back to that decision. Um, Cause I, I believe, you know, I, you graduate from the OHL, you're probably entertaining uh, at least tryout offers or different opportunities uh, in other professional leagues uh, in, in the United States but you chose not to go that route and, and you ultimately chose the law. So how was that? Uh, maybe take us through kind of like that decision-making process. Yeah, so, you know, I'm 21 years old. My hockey career, my eligibility at least is done for, for the junior ranks. Um, I was very set on continuing that and, and continuing to play hockey and I, I had a few offers on the table. Uh, I was very much uh, forcefully convinced that I should get an education. Uh, I was put in contact with Tony Similero and, and Brett Gibson at Queen's University who were both kind of local legends in, in, in the area I'm from, and they, I, I had some connections with their families. Um, they kind of, they put together a, a package, and I kind of said, you know, if, if I'm going to go to school, I want to go to a school that will help me accomplish my goals. Uh, at the time, unfortunately, there was a lot of, you know, obvious mental health issues in pro sports. I think that, that exact year, I think five hockey players lost their life, uh, particularly Terry Trafford, who was an OHL hockey player, um, who unfortunately took his life very young. And so I said, okay, I'm going to have this voice. I have this experience. How can I kind of combine the two? Uh, I went into undergrad thinking I want to, you know, work with this sort of, um, in this field, either from a medical standpoint or a legal standpoint. After the first year, I kind of figured a legal standpoint, you can prevent things from happening. Whereas with medicine, you're treating things that are already happening. Um, so I went down that route. I did my three years of undergrad, applied to Queens Law. Once again, that ended up being my best year of hockey at Queens, and I, I had some more tryouts, and I had to make a decision once again of do I pursue uh, legal studies or, or do I go back to full-time hockey and, and playing in the States. Once again, I made a decision. I, I've come this far. I'll stick with, with academia. It had been good to me. And then, yeah, I, I played it out, got to where I am. I'm at a, a business law firm now, uh, you know, cutting my teeth there, learning all the, the tools of the trade. Um, I've kind of gotten to, throughout my school career, I got to work with uh, the mental health committees at the school. Um, I kind of got pigeonholed into a subset of, of people where student athletes, I had a particular voice with them. So I got to, you know, work on a mental health thing on a, on a you know, in a higher pressure environment. And then at the same time now, I've, I'm wearing my, my Ducky brand apparel, my, my t-shirt. Uh, usually at the office, we're suited down. And today I decided I'm gonna wear this. It uh, was started by a group of hockey players um, in my hometown, a bunch of young guys that are, are very passionate about mental health awareness and destigmatizing things. And 30% of all proceeds from Ducky Brand go to the Canadian Mental Health Association. So uh, I'm rocking that today in support of them, along with all my Bell Let's Talk things. And yeah. Great. Did you ever think, you know, growing up in hockey, and even before the OHL, it's sort of so much pressure. And you're, you grow up with these guys who I'm sure you consider your brothers, everything you've been through. And mental health was never talked about uh, like especially when you're 15 16 years old and now you're a group of guys that are open about uh, the issue and not only um, talking about it but taking action like is it it seems and it doesn't seem hard to believe yeah it, it's almost like it's it the thing that blows my mind is this is a, this has existed since the beginning of time mm -hmm. but we live in a time period of life where it's just becoming prevalent you know when you think of 
obvious diseases like let's say let's take ca cancer for example i can't think of a family or a person who hasn't been affected by cancer and the resources and awareness that get put into screening and you know developing treatments for that is astronomical but yet i would be hard pressed to find a family or a person who hasn't been impacted by mental illness or, or mental health and it's it's you know we're scra we're scrapping uh, scratching the surface in terms of support for that um, but yeah, so to be kind of a, a champion of, of advocating for, for that, it doesn't take much, but it, it, is, it is surprising that, you know, I'm advocating for something that when I was 10 years old, I didn't even think was a thing where I think most 10 year olds now would know that. And, you know, it's, it's something that's easy to do. You know, everyone now is in group chats. All it takes is for one guy to just say, hey, anyone need to talk to? I'm here. Quick little thing. And it just, you know, it uh, disarms everybody and it, it makes everyone more... Uh, with a higher potential to speak about things, and I think that's good for society. Now, you did a lot of advocacy work at Queen's. Did you seek that out, or did they find you, or how did that connection? Because you, I know you did a video project, and you did different things. How did those come to be? Yeah, you know, I, a little, obviously it's a, a little bit more of a private matter, but throughout my life, I've, I've had people close to me with substance abuse issues and, and, and mental health issues and mental illness, and so it's been something that you know, as it became more of a, a mainstream discussion, I, I said, if I ever had an opportunity to, mm -hmm. to seek those out, I, I would. Yeah. Um, luckily, it's, you know, the universe works in interesting ways. The people that I kind of bonded with at Queens were also tied in with these organizations and these committees. And I said, you know, if you ever need any help on anything, I have the voice of mm -hmm. 1,100 student athletes. There's probably a higher uh, incident rate of issues within that subset, that, that subpopulation. And, you know, from there, we did one project went very good you know and it also gave me the confidence that okay this this advocacy does work you know I can I can let people know of resources and and things that are available and then so you know if it's 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 not it doesn't take a tremendous amount of effort to make a big impact on multiple people's lives and mm -hmm. since that first one I, I've been kind of reaching out and, and looking for those opportunities but for the most part you know it came to me naturally and it ended up being a good fit when we think about uh, university, we think you know, in terms of a mental health perspective, we think about the pressure and um, a lot of times the symptoms that can um, be prevalent as a result of a mental health issue and what people are going through. And then, not to turn this into an advertisement for Queens, but I read your thank you letter to, in the Queens Journal, yeah. and I'm going through it and I'm thinking, every if only every young person could have the same experience, like you, the, the way you chronicle your time there, it's, it's, you know, you want, you want to provide that opportunity to anybody who's going to university. And so I wonder if you, like, if you would give somebody advice that's starting, you know, maybe first year at any university, um, what would you tell them in, in terms of trying to, to create the greatest value for their experience in university? Yeah, for, for me, I, I think I'm a naturally introverted person. And again, the friend groups I was in kind of forced me out of my shell and, and to be out of my comfort zone. And even to this day doing this, I'm, I'm out of my comfort zone. But after I complete this, I'm, I'm going to feel like I've had some personal growth. Um, my number one rule for anybody would be to, to get out of your comfort zone, mm -hmm. to, you know, be okay to make mistakes, know that it's all right to make mistakes and just, you know, try everything, try everything, figure out what you like, figure out what you're passionate about and it'll work out. For me, I, I, just like as you mentioned, I've been very fortunate and that's not lost on me in terms of the, the teams that I got to be on and, and the, the opportunities I got to have because of that. Um, it was a very unique experience and I'll never forget that. I'm, I'm always gonna be a, a big Queens pusher because of that. Um, but yeah, I think it all starts with getting out of your comfort zone. And that to me would be the, the secret sauce to, to kind of learning yourself because in university, I think, you know, it's becoming such a, university is kind of, the academic side of it might be getting lost with uh, all the advances in technology and the way society is trending, but it's not gonna, you're not gonna lose that chance for personal development. Mm -hmm. And so for me, I think that who I am today is more so less than the, the papers I wrote or the books I read and the experiences I got to have there, and I'll always be thankful for that. I was just curious if you could elaborate, because I know you mentioned picking law over medicine, you know, one sort of reactive one. When you talk about prevention, I'm just curious where you see yourself going, what, what kind of practice and what you mean by um, supporting people in a preventative way in law, and maybe you could elaborate a little bit more on what your long-term goal is. Yeah, so as I mentioned, I'm, I'm, I'm still very uh, early in my legal career, and I'm, I'm learning how, you know, I, I'd consider it, I'd compare it to power skating. Uh, when I was playing hockey, you know, nobody likes to go power skating, but you can see how it's fundamental to, to your development. Um, being a corporate lawyer, I'm in a position where 
these massive co companies come to us for legal advice and come to us to, to help make their organizations better. And if you can put preventative steps in, in place with these companies, within these companies, make, make them know that it's, a, you know, it's at the forefront of, of your mind as a lawyer in terms of um, what's going to help their business succeed. And then at the same time, you know, as me, I, I think from, a, from an ethical standpoint, it's, it's important. Maybe not every company believes that uh, or follows that. But letting them know that you know the bottom line is going to have a better outcome too. If, if you can if you can improve your your company's mental health, it's going to help their productivity. It's going to you know reduce turnover. Mm -hmm. um, things that that would look like that would be you know there's obviously programs and, and certain things that could be put in place of you know certain amount of, amount of hours you can work or mm -hmm. you know um, right now in law the big hot topic is burnout. Everyone you know they work too much. They front load their career. You know it's one, limiting people's legal capacities, but at the same time, all these law firms are having turnover, trying to recruit new, new lawyers at advanced ages. Um, so yeah, just working with companies to make sure that, you know, this is for the health of the company, is to do this. And, you know, if in turn, it's going to help out thousands of people, like, that's our goal. Right. But it's a, an inadvertent way of going about it. Right. Um, <clears throat> it's mental, uh, it's Bell Let's Talk Day, and uh, we thank you very much for, for sharing your story. Um, and, and like it's always fun to talk hockey and when we can combine it with, with mental health uh, if people want to find out more about you or, and uh, follow you on social media or, and or your company that you're associated with how yep. can they uh, reach out? Yeah, so I'm at Steichman Elliott LLP here in Toronto it's a full service business law firm um, it'll be very easy to find with a Google search uh, if you're interested in my otherwise pretty simple life it's, my handle would be at KW Bailey Bailey's B-A-I-L-I-E. I probably know when it will spell that right correctly the first time. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, again, guys, thanks for having me on. This, this has been an awesome experience. What about uh, Ducky Brand? Yeah, and so this is uh, Ducky Brand Apparel Inc. Um, they're based out of Belleville, but I'm sure they ship all, ship all over Canada. Uh, Aiden Gerduckis, Dan Carcillo, Andrew Shaw, they would be the main contact points. They're always pushing it on their, um, on their social media platforms. And yeah, it's a high quality clothes and you can feel good about what you're wearing if, when, you, uh, when you rock it. All right. Well, thank all you right, very thank much. You. It was uh, great chatting with you and all the best. Yeah, thanks for having me.